Hey there guys, good afternoon. For the final problem in this chapter, we're going to revisit the topic of compact discs, but with a slightly different focus. On the back side of these discs, data is coded using tiny pits that are etched into the surface of the material. These pits start from the inner radius of the CD and they move in an outward spiral towards the edge. I've included one such spiral in this picture, but there's actually a whole lot more. If you were to zoom in on this surface using a microscope, you would see a unique pattern that would look something kind of like this, where these dark spots represent the locations of the pits. Notice that the pits are not of uniform length. We have some short ones, some long ones, and there's a varying distance in the gaps between the pits as well. This arrangement of pits and gaps is unique to whatever kind of information we're trying to store on this object. In our problem, this spiral track of pits and gaps is being scanned by our CD player at a constant linear speed. And the radius of that spiral, as a function of the angle, is given to us in that second paragraph. We're also going to set the direction that the CD rotates in as positive. And this means the beta constant in our spiral radius equation will be positive as well. Let's take a look at the five different parts that the problem wants us to do. For part A, we're given another equation, and that describes an infinitely small distance along that spiral track. We need to take the previous equation for the radius of the spiral as a function of the angle and use that in conjunction with this new equation. Then we can integrate and come up with a new equation that describes the total distance. In the next part, we're going to take that total distance equation and set it equal to the product of the linear velocity and time. This strategy allows us to solve for another equation, one that describes the total rotational angle as a function of time. We're given a hint about that equation and which solution we should pick, but it's up to us to figure out its form and explain why we should choose the positive solution in particular. This angle equation will come in handy for part C, where we use it to solve for the angular velocity and angular acceleration as functions of time. Once that's done, we're going to answer the question about whether the angular acceleration is constant. Then in part D, the problem description gives us a bunch of numbers for an example CD and wants us to find the values of R0, beta, and the total number of revolutions that are made during the 74 minutes of playtime. And finally, in part E, we're going to take everything that we gathered from parts C and D and create some graphs using those numbers. That's it. Now, this video is, <laughs> of course, going to be a bit longer, so please feel free to skip around using the timestamps in the video description if needed. Let's begin with part A. Our starting point is this differential distance equation that's been provided for us. We want to plug in the equation for the radius of the spiral as a function of theta for r, like this, and then integrate both sides of this equation. Let's start with the left-hand side. If we integrate ds, we get the full quantity of s, 
which is a function of the integration variable, theta. On the other side, r0 is a constant, and so the integration will just attach a theta to it. In the other term, beta is also a constant, and so the integral of theta with respect to theta gives us theta squared divided by 2. And here's the result for the right-hand side. Since our integral didn't have upper and lower limits, we are required to include a constant of integration, which is this capital C here. And we can figure out the value of C by using the initial conditions of this expression. Before the CD even starts playing, the starting angle for theta is zero. So let's plug in zero everywhere that we see theta in this second line. R naught multiplied by zero is zero, so that term can get tossed. Beta multiplied by zero squared divided by two is zero, so that term can be removed as well. And if we move over to the other side, the total distance along the track before the CD even starts playing also has to be zero. So ultimately, the constant of integration is equal to zero as well, which means we don't even need it. Let's just throw that constant in the garbage now that we have uh, justification for doing so and just keep the rest of the expression. And this will be our answer to part A. For part B, we're told that the equation we just found is equal to vt. We need to use this relation to figure out the total rotational angle as a function of time. Naturally, the first thing we should do is plug in the definition for s of theta. And if you look closely, we can see a pattern going on here. We have a term with theta squared, a term with theta, and then something else on the other side with no theta at all. To make the pattern a bit more obvious, I'll move vt over to the left-hand side and then rewrite this expression in descending powers of theta, rearranging theta on the outside of the parentheses, like this. So now it's super clear. We have a quadratic expression in theta. And for our a term, we have beta divided by 2. r naught is our b term, and negative vt will be our c term. If we stick these into the quadratic formula, here's what we get. So this is what the problem description was talking about when it mentioned two solutions. But before we mess around with that, let's do some simplification and clean this up a little bit. There we go. Looks much better now. Now we can pick the positive solution, which means we will be adding this square root term rather than subtracting it. And I'm actually going to rearrange the numerator so that the negative term doesn't come first, like this. To me, this looks a little bit cleaner. And with that complete, we have now arrived at the answer for part B. But we're not quite done yet. Remember, we need to explain why the positive solution is the correct choice to pick. Think of it this way. We want theta as a function of time to be positive as time increases. This would follow the convention that the CD is spinning in the positive direction. If we used the negative solution, our numerator would be minus the square root of some stuff minus r naught. So a bunch of negative stuff in the numerator divided by a positive quantity in the denominator. Is it possible to divide a negative by a positive 
and get a positive result? Well, no, it, it doesn't work that way. If you choose the negative solution, theta would also have to be negative, which would physically correspond to the CD spinning in the backwards direction. So that is why we have to pick the positive solution for our quadratic. Let's move on to part C. We want the angular velocity as a function of time, which means we can use this definition to help us out. Let's insert the expression for theta of t and then pull out the beta constant from the denominator. The derivative can be distributed to both terms inside the parentheses. And since r0 is a constant, its derivative is 0. So we can drop that term entirely and just ignore it. With that out of the way, we're now ready to begin the process of using the chain rule for this derivative. Our innermost function will be everything inside the square root, and the outermost one will be the square root function itself. So what we're going to do is first let our substitution variable u be equal to the innermost function. And then we'll take a derivative of both sides with respect to t to get du dt. Our chain rule states that the derivative that we want here on the left is equal to the derivative of the outer function with respect to the substitution variable multiplied by du dt. Well, we know what du dt is already, so we just need the derivative of this outer square root function. Recall that you can rewrite the square root of a variable as that variable raised to the one-half power. So feel free to do that if it makes things easier for you. If we apply the derivative power rule to this outer function, we get the following. And here I've plugged in the value for du dt from the top line above. To finish up this process, we need to plug in the definition of u, then cancel out the 1 half with the 2, and move beta v into the numerator of this ratio. Let's also bring that factored constant of 1 over beta back into the picture before we forget about it. Now we can multiply these together and eliminate beta, well, except for the beta, inside the square root located in the denominator. And now our derivative is done. This is the expression for the angular velocity as a function of time. Next is the angular acceleration. This definition is similar to what we had for the angular velocity, except now it's a second order derivative. Instead of doing the first derivative all over again to get to the second one, we can just grab our result from the last slide and take another derivative of that. Let's factor out the linear velocity from the numerator and use the exact same approach as we did before. The inner function of this new derivative is actually the same as the last one. The only thing that changes is that our outer function is now 1 divided by the square root function. And since our inner function stays the same, our substitution variable of u and du dt stay the same as well. So that saves us on a little bit of time. Like before, our chain rule states that the derivative that we want located on the left is equal to the derivative of the outer function with respect to the substitution variable multiplied by du dt. And the outer function has been converted to exponential notation here. 
we can use another application of the derivative power rule. And when we do that, here's what pops out. To finish this up, let's cancel out the 1 half and the 2, and then move u to the negative 3 halves power downstairs to turn that exponent positive. Next, exchange u for our definition in the top line, and then bring back that factored out linear velocity constant from earlier. The v's will multiply together and combine, resulting in v squared, and that's it. Here's our angular acceleration equation. Now, is this constant? Well, the only variable that changes in this expression is time, which gets larger and larger. So overall, the denominator of this expression will become bigger, whereas the numerator just stays the same. Therefore, the answer to this question is no, it is not constant. And that's all for part C. Let's take a look at part D next. We have this sample CD, which has an inner track radius of 25 millimeters, which is exactly what R0 represents. So <laughs> there's one part of the answer right off the bat. That's pretty easy. We're also told that for every revolution, the radius of the spiral track will increase by 1.55 micrometers. Remember that the radius of that spiral track as a function of theta is equal to this expression. Let's take that and plug it in on the left hand side and use it to solve for beta. Since we have R0 on both sides, we can just subtract that out and get rid of it. And from here, we need to figure out how to express theta so that when we divide it on both sides, it will eliminate revolutions in exchange for radians over on the right. Let's try this. There's two pi radians for every revolution. And when we divide this ratio, it gets flipped upside down over on the other side, which properly cancels out revolutions in favor of radians, just like we wanted. Now, beta has the proper unit representation, and we can report this as the second part of our answer. Let's go ahead and use this result to get the total number of revolutions next. First, we should probably convert micrometers to meters so that we're prepared for what's to come. There's 10 to the 6 micrometers in a meter, which means that we can just multiply the value of beta by 10 to the minus 6 to express it in meters per radian. Let's convert R0 to meters as well. There's 10 to the 3 millimeters in a meter, so just take 25.0 and multiply it by 10 to the minus 3 to get the value in meters. One more thing, uh, we can't use minutes for time as well. We're going to be multiplying time by a quantity that uses seconds. So we'll need to adjust this to match. Just multiply 74 minutes by 60 seconds per minute, and there is our seconds value that we're going to use. OK, so what are we going to do with all of these numbers? Well, recall that we figured out this equation a couple slides back. It tells us the total number of radians 
for some amount of CD playtime. But the problem isn't asking for total radiance. It wants total revolutions. So there's an extra step required here. What we can do is plug in all of our numbers into this expression, just like this, and then we can convert radians to revolutions by dividing using this conversion factor of 2 pi radians per revolution in the denominator. Since all the numbers that we were provided contain three significant figures, we should probably report the number of revolutions using the same amount. And here's that number. And that's all for part D. This is our answer. There's one last part to finish, and that's the graphing. I'll start with the angular velocity, and here's our equation for that. The plan is to plug in our converted numbers for r naught and beta, like this, and then graph this function using time on the x-axis, ranging from 0 to 4,440 seconds. Here's a picture of what that looks like. For the angular acceleration, the process is pretty much identical. You just grab your equation, then plug in all the values, and plot your graph. That's really all there is to it. With part E complete, everything is now done. Here's our solution card with a summary of all of the answers that we obtained for each part minus the graphs. We're now ready to close up this chapter and move on to dynamics of rotational motion, which involves topics like torque, um, angular momentum, and the rotational analog of F equals MA. But for now, that's all I have for us. Thanks for watching, folks. I'll see you around.